Good evening, and welcome to the celebration of the liturgy with Our Lady and Dura of Mount Parish. Today is the Feast of the Epiphany. We are a parish of the Catholic Apostolic Church of North America, or Casina, as we are known. We are also a chapter of Dignity USA, which is dedicated to sacramental justice for all, specifically the LGBTQ plus community and their allies. Our vision is to rebuild Christ's church by seeking out and accommodating a, and providing an accepting, accommodating, and aspirational spiritual home for disenchanted, disengaged, and disaffected Catholics and others. All who come with respect are welcome here. Now let us take a moment to pause, be silent, and place ourselves in the presence of God as we prepare for the liturgy to begin. Our celebrant this evening is our pastor, Father Al Christorfer. Please stand and join in our, in our opening hymn, numbers 373, number 373, We Three Kings. We are singing verses 1 and 3.
Lord Jesus, who came to reconcile us to one another and to the Father, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, who healed the wounds of sin and division, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, who intercedes for us with your Father, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world unto himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God grant you pardon and peace. And I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away and your daughter shall be carried on the nurse's arm. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those of Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our response to order him to be found in your gathered book, number 72, Every Nation on Earth. We will be doing the frame one.
second reading is a reading from the letter of St. Saint Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known, made, was made known to me by revelation. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it now has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Uh, we apparently have a Facebook glitch. <laughs> so if any of your friends were 
going to tune in tonight. I apologize. It's something, it was weird, I got a message early this morning that said, your live broadcast will begin in 16 minutes. So I went and checked, you know, and sure enough, we were scheduled for tonight. So somewhere in there, someplace, that message was a harboring of things to come, I suppose. But we are on YouTube and Vimeo and on our website, so I, why Facebook decided that we were going to broadcast at 2 a.m. in the morning when it wasn't told to is beyond me. Um, we'll talk about that later, because I think I need an assistant producer here or something to keep me honest. But once again, thank you for coming. It's a, another horrible night in terms of weather, so I appreciate you coming out. Not to mention the holiday. Uh, this is still going on for a couple more hours. Um, as, you, as you just heard in the scripture readings, one of the most constant and prolific and meaningful contrasts across all of the scriptures is this dichotomy between dark and light, between the world of darkness and the world of light. Darkness for almost all writers of scriptures in almost all traditions is the primordial residence of all that is evil. The devil, who is the embodiment of evil, is referred to as the prince of darkness. Darkness is a state that is devoid of life, empty of happiness, absent all that is holy. It is the great negative of negatives. Nothing good comes from darkness, at least as the scriptures say. By contrast, light is where God lives. Light is the sign of love. It is the declaration of love. It is the state of happiness. But in Genesis, light is the very first thing God creates so that it can shine on all the rest of creation that then follows. God said, fiat lux, let there be light, and there was light. And then God said, it was good. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us that he is the light of the world, the light that shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot grasp it, or will not grasp it. And as Isaiah just prophesied in our first reading, rise up in splendor, Jerusalem, your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick clouds cover the peoples, but upon you the Lord shines, and over you appears his glory. Nations shall walk by your light, and kings by your shining radiance. In our scripture reading from Matthew this evening, we see the same dichotomy played out further as the wise seekers of truth and justice and goodness and God, therefore, search in the darkness of the night sky, guided only by a star of light, a light that leads them to the light of the world and to the person of the young Jesus, the Savior who is God himself, God who is God from light and light from light, as we say in our creed. Um, I remember my first years in the seminary, the graduate school, which we called the theology, actually all seminaries call it that, or in our case at St. Charles Borromeo, the upper side. And although in undergrad we had extensively studied Latin and Greek, and actually some Hebrew, and translated scriptural text from those original languages, we never really studied theology. It was a bachelor's in philosophy. And we kind of touched a little bit on it from a philosophical standpoint. But now in grad school, we're about to become inundated with the study of divine things. In fact, we studied little else. We were also excited 
This, after all, was what the seminary was all about. This was the runway to the priesthood. This was finally the serious stuff. Um, Reverend Dr. Dan Merritt, however, was one of our professors. And he was one of the leading scripture scholars in the American church at that time. Later he proved to be a very good friend of mine. That first class of his was an introduction to contemporary scriptural analysis, in which we were to learn about what he called the demythologization of scripture. He said he was going to blow up almost everything the nuns taught us. <laughs> because to get through life forever as a priest, he said, he needed to be grounded in faith. And that, in turn, had to be grounded in truth, not myth. And one of the examples of myth versus truth that Father Murray focused on that morning in September was this one, the story of the Magi. There were no three kings. There were no wise men. Father said, this event never actually happened. But there's truth under the story that we need to find. The story of the major has power because it teaches us about God's true plan for salvation, and that's what will bolster our faith. You know, as we know, there are four Gospels. Um, but how many Christmas stories are there? Two. Only two. Luke's and Matthew's. Yet Matthew is the only gospel that mentions this story of the wise men. To which the Father Mary's point is somewhat curious, isn't it? I mean, I, wouldn't you think that something as amazing as this visitation by these unusual people Coming to see the young child would have been mentioned by somebody, somewhere, somehow. But for some reason, only Matthew tells this story. So indeed, this story is here because Matthew has something he wants us all to learn. Something about light and darkness. So let's see what that is. Matthew calls them magi. And the actual word, word in Greek, you know me and my Greek, the actual word in Greek is magos, which itself is derived from an old Persian word called magus, which is the name of a Persian priestly caste of the Zoroastrian faith. And as part of their religion, these priests paid particular attention to the stars, and they gained an international reputation for astrology, which at the time was considered a highly regarded science. These were highly educated people. Notice Matthew never said there were three of them. In fact, if such a group had traveled at that time, it would more than likely have been a caravan of dozens. And as for the star, only the Magi, as deep astrologers, see it. There's a lot of stuff in the news today about how, what is it, Saturn and Jupiter are going to come together and we've actually had another piece. Did anybody notice it? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, this thing would not have been noticed by untrained eyes. Notice that Herod and all of his court, they never noticed it. The Magi had to tell them. And then they still couldn't see. So here's our first lesson. Much like being attentive to angels and to invitations from God that you've heard me talk about, those things sent into our lives that say God is calling, here too, only those who are alert, who are looking 
for the signs and wonders can see the light out there. They come from Anatole, that's the word in Greek, which means from the rising of the sun. In other words, the east. The east is where the new day begins. It's where light begins. It's where every day the light of the sun rises in the heavens. Here then is Matthew's second lesson. The birth of Christ is a new day dawning on the earth. It's a new beginning for all of us, a day of salvation, and it's full of light. And the star foretells the birth of the king of the Jews. Did you hear that? Herod's the king of the Jews. And these guys are to deliver that message to Herod? I mean, Herod also had four sons. Well, eventually down to three when he executed one of them. But they were thinking they would succeed their father someday. But for the Magi, hello, herd and royal princes, we have found your replacement. Seems a kind of weird thing to say to a reigning king. But that's exactly Matthew's next point. First to his readers, who were, as I've told you many times, former Jews themselves, who had witnessed the destruction of the Jerusalem and the temple, and along with it, their hopes. But also to us, who may well be in our own way to, depressed in these times. Yet Matthew says, fear not, there's a new king. But not some sort of earthly monarch. Not one you might expect. That is never and never was God's plan. Jesus fits none of the expectations of the Jews of that time, nor some of those who hold similar views today. No, the true Messiah is actually God himself, human, but not an earthly hero. God's arrival was in the most unassuming, unexpected way as a vulnerable child, laid in a manger, a food trough for animals, so that he could become food for all. And the Magi come to worship, to pay homage to this new king, this new kind of king. And so they brought gifts. As you just heard, and as Isaiah foretold in that first reading, they came indeed bearing gold and frankincense. Gold symbolizing virtue and royalty, and frankincense symbolizing prayer. But then Matthew adds to Isaiah's list with one small little oddball addition. Matthew's story, the Magi also bring myrrh. Myrrh was used as an embalming oil. It was used to anoint dead bodies before they were entombed or buried, since it often helped soften the smell of decaying flesh. <laughs> I mean, imagine if someone brought your newborn baby embalming fluid as a birthday gift. But that's what they did. So once again, odd, huh? Matthew is saying that this third gift foreshadowed what this Messiah was and why he was so good. This Messiah was meant to die as a sacrifice. In fact, the title King of the Jews that the star announced is used only one more time in Matthew's Gospel. Do you know where? It's what's atop the cross. Here is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And the high priest said, don't say King of the Jews, say he said he was the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. So as St. John Chrysostom says, these gifts are what we bring not to a king, but to a God. 
Matthew is asking us, do you see Jesus as king, but as also priest, and as also sacrifice? And if so, what are the gifts you will bring, we will bring, I will bring? What are our versions of gold and frankincense of myrrh? I mean, how do we honor his lordship? How do we raise our hearts in prayer? And how do we let the sacrifice of Christ impact us? There's two more lessons. First, the Jewish converts or Matthew's audience would not object at all to their anticipated Messiah bringing Gentiles into the fold as new Jews, which is what Isaiah said should happen in our first reading. But as the church became clear about its mission that was given by Christ to it in the last phrase of the same gospel, go make disciples of all nations, more and more Gentiles were entering into the faith community without first converting to Judaism. And this was very unsettling for the Jewish conquest even heretical. So whoever was the Pauline disciple responsible for our second reading, the letter to the Ephesians, it probably wasn't written by Paul. He overtly states this heretical belief when he says, Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And although this is not what the Jewish converts wanted to hear, it's really good news for all of us. The true Messiah is the Savior of the world. Salvation is for everyone, everywhere, and for all time. It is not the entitlement of a few. And just like the Jews of that time, there are many churches today, and families today, and groups today, and political parties today, and companies today, you name it. would be do well to remember that. Salvation is not theirs to dish out on their terms. It belongs to God who gives freedom and forgives freedom. And if you hear differently, then get up and go home as the mage I did by a different route. What is required for salvation, for any of us who receive this invitation, for any who see the star, is to get moving toward it, to change, and when you arrive at the Lord's presence, to do him homage. And herein lies Matthew's last lesson. We must get up and move toward the light as the Magi. We must take action as we hear or see the call having the courage and fortitude to get up and move on. Move in the direction that, as I've said many times, often is very risky and it's often very inconvenient. It will cost us, it will disturb us, it will mean sacrifice. I mean, the Magi, if they had existed, the distance from their homeland to Bethlehem is probably about 1,900 kilometers. Even by today, it would take a 25-hour drive to go from one to the other. Compare the devotion and determination of the Magi with that of Herod. Herod refuses to go a few miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. He doesn't want to check up on anything, let alone the accuracy of biblical prophecies. And likewise, the Jewish chief priests and elders and, and scholars. These people he consults. No one bothers to follow up on this amazing news. Except later we find out that Herod's ways of dealing with this gift from God was to try to stuff it out. So Matthew was asking, where are we on this thing? Are we willing to be inconvenienced? For the one who died for us? Are we willing to exert the time and the energy to build a relationship with our God? Are we willing to be as selfless and vulnerable as the baby and his mother? 
Are we willing to be as generous to be food and sustenance for others as Jesus is? Matthew's story says that God will show himself completely to anyone who will seek him. There are no special ones, no chosen people. As encounters with Christ is open to us all, but be aware this Christ is different and that he's not only king, but he's priest and sacrifice too. And he calls each of us to get up and come to him, to follow the star of light and move away from darkness. Matthew included this story about the manger in his gospel to proclaim that although the mystery of Christ began with the chosen people, the good news of salvation is meant for the entire world. It's meant for you and it's meant for me and all of us. It's meant for everyone. And that's what today is all about. So, may the light of Christ fill each of you, and may his grace encourage each of you to go out and find him all through this new year. Amen. Amen. Please join me in professing our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, one in me with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born the Virgin Mary and became a human. For our sin, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe in all of one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Kings bow down before the Lord, all nations serve him. He has enriched us with a diverse world, so let us turn to him in prayer for its needs. For the faithful, that we may be a light to all nations, leading all to the good news of Christ. We pray to the Lord, 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 Lord. For all the nations of the earth, that they come to know the greatness of God's providence, we pray to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. For those entrusted with governments of peoples and nations, that they may lead by humble service, following Jesus' example. We pray to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. For a return to seeking wisdom as a holy and human pursuit, we pray to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. For those who live in fear of strangers, others whom they have never encountered, and people whom they only see differences, we pray to the Lord, 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 Lord hear our prayer. For those whose journey is difficult and whose spirits are weary, we pray to the Lord, 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 Lord hear our prayer. For astronomers, astronauts, and others who study the skies to improve our lives, and our understanding. We pray to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. For the gift of hospitality towards people of every language, culture, creed, and way of life. We pray to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. For an end to the pandemic that is ravaging our world, for the scientists and doctors working on cures and treatments, and for healthcare workers and first responders, that they may be protected as they serve our communities. We pray to the Lord, 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 Lord,
We offer a prayer of gratitude for all those who have heard the call to support our parish and our mission with their time, talent, and treasure. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. <clears throat> Let us take a moment as we offer up all the prayers we hold in our hearts. And for all those petitions to Our Lady and Lord of Knox that we have received on the website, especially for the Panabianco and the Santos families, Lily Zong, Lisa Staley, Bob Scales, Sharon Glass, and Chris Henry's home. For all of these prayers, spoken and unspoken, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrate the mystery of your incarnation, and witness how you drew to yourself the high and the low, the shepherd and the king, the wise and the unlearned, we pray that you might also draw us to you and make us true disciples. You live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with all of you. And also with you. Let us all for each other a way. Join with me as we offer our gifts to the Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God, Christ. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Pray, brethren, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Lord, accept the offering of your church, not gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but the sacrifice and food they symbolize. Jesus Christ, who is for Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We live on the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Today you revealed in Christ your eternal plan of salvation and showed him as the light of all peoples. Now that his glory has shone among us, you have renewed humanity in his immortal image. 
Now with the angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we sing the unending hymn of praise. supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and prayers, gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me.
Let us ask God our Father to forgive our sins and to bring us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin, and protect us from all anxiety, as we wait with joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours.
Let us pray. Father, guide us with your light. Help us to recognize Christ in this Eucharist and welcome him with love, for he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now we'll sing Immaculate Mary on page 5 of your booklet as we pray with you the icon.